Well, hey y'all, welcome back to another video. Today, we are going to be doing kind of like a little Bible study. It's going to be us going through a lot of scripture and whatnot, and I've never actually done a video like this on my channel, so this is going to be kind of interesting. I recently got the opportunity to speak at my local church to a few women, and so I wanted to share with y'all what I shared with them, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently since I'm sitting in front of a camera now and I'm not speaking, uh, but it is going to be kind of like a Bible study, so if you have the opportunity and you would like to join me, I would love for you to go get your Bible so you can go through these scriptures with me uh, because I think it'll be very helpful. So when I got the opportunity to speak, they asked me to speak about love and I had the opportunity to do whatever I wanted to do and I could have gone many directions. They gave me full freedom as long as I related it back to love. Well, I really thought about it and I was just like, I don't know exactly what I want to talk about, but then something did spark in my mind and I wanted to talk about something that I thought not very many people really talk about or not that I know of exactly that I hear a lot of talk about. But like I said, I could have gone pretty much any direction. I was thinking, well, maybe I'll talk about like wives loving husbands, you know, Valentine's is coming up and, you know, maybe we can talk about that. And then I thought, well, I could talk about the love for my kids and how it is to be, you know, a mom and loving, you know, your children. And then I thought, well, we are in a group of women. Maybe I'll talk about, you know, friendship and loving each other and how we should be toward one another and godly love and whatnot like that. But I ultimately settled on the love of God. So how I started it off was how does God love us, right? How does God show his love for us, God the Father? Well, in Jeremiah 31, 3, if you go to that text, it says this, the Lord appeared to him from afar saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. We see here very plainly that the Lord loves us. Um, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. An everlasting. That means eternal. That means before time, like the Lord loves us outside of time, outside of space, like he loves us that much, right? And it's crazy to think about that he loved us before we were even formed in our mother's womb, right? There's other scripture to back that up. And then I also thought about maybe Romans 5, 8, right? That clearly states his love for us. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we see here that God loved us while we were still in our sin. While we were still sinning, before we were saved, he loved us. He loved us so much that Christ died for us. He gives us his son to die for us, right? And I also then thought about Ephesians 2, right? 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. Even though we were dead in our sin, because we were dead, okay? Dead. Dead, dead. Stinky, nasty. We was dead, okay? We were dead in our sins, Yet, he made us alive again. We are able to have eternal life because he gave us Christ. He loves us so much that he gave his son, which is the most common verse I believe anybody lost, saved, knows, right? Is John three sixteen, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He gives his only begotten son. He's showing sacrificial love. He gives us his son. And that's how he demonstrates his love for us. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I love my kids. But I'm not just going to give them up to just anyone, for anyone. And especially someone I know ain't going to do right by me. But he does that right? He does that for us. He continues to do that for us. This is for past, present, and future. He is sacrificially loving us. 
And then I thought about the son, right? The begotten one that he's speaking of is his son, right? And how he shows his love for us, right? And I thought I could talk about his love for us in that way, right? And I truly believe that like all four gospels prove Jesus's love for us, right? I mean, he was the sacrifice. He sh- he shows us that clearly in all four, four gospels through his birth, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We see his love for us, right? He didn't have to come and be born. He could have just popped up on the scene. But because he loves us, He became like us. He humbled himself, became a servant, became in human form, in flesh for us so that he could die, so that he could go to the cross. He did that all willingly. He already knew the plan. It wasn't like, oh, surprise, Jesus coming on the scene and all of a sudden uh, now I got to die. No, he knew. He already knew what was going to take place. He already knew before the foundation of the earth was created. He knew what was going to happen. And so he comes and he also knew that he was going to have to suffer. So, yeah, Jesus could have done this a whole different way. They could have set up a plan to where Jesus just comes. He shows himself. He says, I'm God and peace be with you. And he's gone, right? No pain, no suffering. But... He lovingly suffers for us. Another scripture that I think really concretes Jesus's love for us is John 15 verses 12 through 14, which say this, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. I don't know about y'all, but I don't know any friends that I'm just going to lay down my life willingly for. And especially like when people are so crazy, right? I'm not saying I wouldn't like, okay, right? I'm, I heard what he said. But what I'm saying is we don't just go, yeah, sure. I'll totally lay down my life for you. No, that's just not how we operate as human beings. But Jesus not only lays down his life, but then after he lays down his life for us, he calls us his friends, his friends, even though we betray him. Even though we're mean to him, even though we don't listen to him, he calls us his friends. What? Are you for real? I'm Jesus's friend after all the things I done did? Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's crazy. How loving is that, that he continues to call us his friend? Despite who we are as people. Because I'm not going to lie to y'all. People, we, we can be trash. And I don't mean that to be mean. I just mean that to be truthful. Like we can be trash people. And yet Jesus still loves us and calls us his friend. So those are all the ways, right, in which God the Father and God the Son love us. But the point that I wanted to be made and the point that blew my mind was this. The Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity. He loves us. The Holy Spirit loves you and me. Now, there isn't direct scripture that says like God the Father and God the Son, how they love us, right? There's not the word love being used. But what we do know about agape love is that it's sacrificial, right? Love in action. Love is an action, okay? It's not just a feeling. It can be a feeling, but it is also an action. It's something that we do. We show love for one another, right? And so I hope that what you take from this is that you see the love of the Holy Spirit for you, how he loves you, the ways he shows his love to you. So the first way that I believe that he shows his love for us is that he gives us spiritual gifts, right? Without spiritual gifts, we are not able to operate and glorify the Lord in our worldly ways, right? We can't glorify God in our worldly flesh. So 1 Corinthians 12 verse 
4 through 8 says this. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. The Holy Spirit gifts us. Right. So right here, clearly in scripture, we all receive a gift from the Holy Spirit, not by anything that we earned, but by what he chooses to give us. We all individually have different gifts. Not all gifts are the same, but we are all in gifted with a spiritual gift. I'm not sure what your spiritual gift is. That is something that is between you and the Lord to figure out. But we all individually have a spiritual gift to glorify the Father. Another way that the Holy Spirit loves us is through giving us power. Acts 1 verse 8 says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. See, he gives us the power in order to witness about God, about Jesus, in order to evangelize, in order to give people the gospel. That power only comes from the Holy Spirit. He is showing and exercising his love for the Father and the Son by allowing us to have that same power. And that same power is flowing. So the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is also the same power that lives in you. That is the exact same power. There's not a different power, a lower level power. No, that's the same power. And so it's to be a witness. He also unites us as believers. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says this, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Because of the Holy Spirit, that's what sets us apart, right? That's what makes us different from everyone else. That's what makes us different from this religion, that religion, all of these other things, these different beliefs, is that we have the Holy Spirit. In order to possess the Holy Spirit, you have to be born again, right? We have the Holy Spirit, which unites us all. That's what makes us be able to come together and have the same mind and be on the same accord, right? That is what, that's how he unites us is through his spirit. Whether you are black, white, Asian, Mexican, whatever it is, the reason that we can be in different cultural backgrounds and all of that and be united is because of the Holy Spirit, that dwells in all of this. That's how we do that. That's how we can get along is because of the Holy Spirit. Another way that the Holy Spirit shows his love for us is that he teaches us. He teaches us the scriptures and we see that very clearly in John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So the Holy Spirit reminds us of the words of Jesus. So the only ways that we know the words of Jesus is if we are in our Bible, if we are reading. The only way we can defend against the enemy is to know your Bible because the Holy Spirit, whether you're in front of your Bible or not, is going to bring it up to you. It's He's going to bring it to your remembrance. So you're like, that's what God meant. Oh my goodness. There we go. There it is. That's, you know, all of the things. But if you're not reading your word, you're not going to know what Jesus said. You're not going to know what God wants and expects of your life. So he can't bring anything to remembrance if there's nothing to bring to remembrance. Another thing I think that is cool about the Holy Spirit is that he gives us the words to say. So when we don't know what to talk about, he knows what we need. He knows what to say. He knows how to minister to other believers. He knows. He knows how to minister to those who are going to become believers. He knows what they need in that moment. And if we are exercising knowing the word, then he can bring those words to mind. Mark 13, 11 says this, when they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. So we can be confident that when we don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will speak for us. He is going to do our bidding. He is going to do what he knows how to do, which is speak 
the truth. The Holy Spirit is also wise and he gives us wisdom. First Corinthians 2, 12 and 13 say this. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So, Not only does he give us the words to say, but they are the words of wisdom. Words of wisdom come from the Father. He is only speaking of what the Father has told him to speak. He is speaking with wise words, right? The world isn't going to give the same advice that the Bible does. The world is not thinking in alignment with Christ So they're not going to talk and do and react and work in the same ways that the Holy Spirit is going to. The Holy Spirit is wise. He knows the Father intimately, right? So he is only going to speak and give wisdom. That's why it's important that you are around other believers. That is who you're seeking counsel and wisdom from is other believers, not people who are in the world. Again, I've said this time and time again, of course, some of the things that people are going to say are going to come off wise. They're going to come off like, oh yeah, they know what to do. But ultimately, wisdom comes from the Lord. So anything that a worldly person says, you kind of got to take with a grain of salt because they don't know the Lord. One of the ways that I love that the Holy Spirit shows his love is through conviction. I wasn't very familiar with conviction when I was starting out my journey and my walk, um, but slowly but surely I realized what conviction was. And before I would say that I was a little bit nervous about conviction, but now I welcome it because That just means to me that the Holy Spirit is doing what he is told to do and that I am operating in the eternal things by being obedient and by listening and by, you know, gleaning wisdom from him. And so in John 6, 8, it says this, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness and judgment. So he convicts us of our sin so that we can become righteous so that when we are in judgment, the Lord does not see us. He sees Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the righteousness of himself. The Holy Spirit also calls us to be bold, right? He gives us boldness. In Acts 4.31, it says this, And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. The only way that we are able to speak of things, the only way that I am able to do what I do and speak freely about my past is because I know who saved me. I know Jesus. I know that I was truly saved. I know that I'm no longer the person that I was before. I no longer live, but Christ in me. I am different. I am changed. Therefore, I can speak about the things of my past willingly with boldness because I've been saved from it. I don't, I no longer possess the guilt, the shame, any of that. I'm free from all of that. So I'm going to speak as if I'm free. I'm going to shout it from the rooftops. Yes, I was a sinner of sinners, but now I live for Christ and Christ alone. He also guides us in all truth, right? John 16, 13 says this, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. The Holy Spirit can only speak truth. That's it. He can only speak truth. So he's going to guide you in all truth. And the truth lies in the word of God. That's it. There's nothing else. All right. So I have one final last point to prove that the Holy Spirit loves you and loves me. And this truth This realization literally blew my mind when I thought about it. And I was just like, are you for real? Like, I never considered this. And it was just like, wow, the love the Holy Spirit has for me is unreal. So like I've said in the beginning of this, 
of course, we hear, we've heard sermons, we know all of these things about the love of the Father and the love of the Son, but have we really, really considered how the love of the Holy Spirit is for us, how much He truly loves us, how sacrificial He really is? Well, the way that I know this is in Scripture. It is in John 14, verses 16 and 17, which say this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. God, the Holy Spirit, who knows no sin, dwells in sinful man. I don't know if you guys have read the Old Testament lately or know anything about the Old Testament, which I highly suggest if you have not read the Old Testament, go read it. Go read it. Start reading it today, please. Because that is the way that I grew substantially in my faith. Like truly, that's how I grew so much is reading who God the Father was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, The priests, in order to go into the Holy of Holies, they had to be cleansed. They couldn't go in there with sins on their back. You know, they had to be cleansed from their sins. And if they weren't, and they went in the Holy of Holies, they would die. Because God cannot be near sin, okay? So they would legit tie a rope to the priest's leg, and guys would stand outside of the doors And if he went in and he fell down dead, they would just pull him out, okay? Pull him out because God cannot be near sin. Yet the Holy Spirit dwells in sinful man. The Holy Spirit dwells in a temple that is sinful, a temple that rejects him. He continues to dwell there. A temple that is rebellious. He continues to dwell there. My mind was blown. The Holy Spirit sacrifices daily for the betterment of human beings to the glorification of God the Father to conform us to the image of Christ. The Holy Spirit loves you. The third person in the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit loves you. All right, y'all, that was it. That was what I came up with. I hope that this legit gave you a perspective of the Holy Spirit and allowed you to see his love for you because I have never seen his love like that before. And I totally suggest that you go and look these scriptures up, that you truly see how much the Holy Spirit loves us, that he would dwell in sinful man, continue to sacrifice daily for us. Crazy, mind-blowing. All right, I'll catch y'all in the next video. God bless y'all and go and be a light out there.